All right, everyone. We're going to get started if everyone can take their seats. I'll give it 30 seconds so we can make sure everyone's seated. All right. Well, Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the September 28th, 2023 Social Equity Working Group meeting. And I am calling today's meeting to order at 9.33. Clerk, can you please confirm that we have quorum? Good morning. Yes, we do have a quorum at this time. Great, thank you. And before we get started, I would like to ask today's interpreter, Alejandra, to introduce themselves and walk through how to access our interpretation services for today's meeting. Hello, this is your Spanish interpreter speaking. This is an announcement from the interpreter. To use the interpretation feature, to use the interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon, the world, and select English as your language. If you are joining through the Zoom mobile app, cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, the interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish flow in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation. If you are in the meeting room, please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lobby. Este es un aviso por parte del intérprete. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación, el globo terráqueo, y seleccione Spanish, que es español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, celular, tablet, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si se encuentra en la sala de reunión, favor de pedir auriculares con la recepcionista del vestíbulo. Thank you. And before we begin with our agenda items, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we call home. The tribal nations of the San Diego region has historically faced injustices. And with that, we acknowledge the harmony that exists between the land, nature, and its original peoples who have since endured displacement, persecution, and systemic oppression. We pay our respect to the unceded territory and homelands of the 18 tribal nations in our region, the most in any county in the United States, from four cultural groups, the Kumeyaay, Digeño, the Luiseño, the Cupeño, and the Cahuilla. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the Sandag community, we acknowledge this legacy we aspire to learn from indigenous traditional knowledge and experiences in undoing the injustices of the past. And I will review the, review the meeting process for both the working group members as well as the members of the public who wish to participate. And of course, for working group members, when you'd like to speak, if you could just please raise your hand and I will call on you by name. In front of you are iPads where you will find today's agenda and supporting materials by clicking on the arrow on the top left. Please note that you can zoom in and out using the iPad touch screen. Clerk, do you mind uh, giving us a quick reminder on how the public comments will work? Thank you, Chairwoman. Yes, we will take public comments on items on the agenda um, with in-person public comments, submitting a speaker slip to me and online virtual commenters, raise your hand at the beginning of the item presentation. I will call on in-person commenters first and then virtual. Thank you. Thank you. Do any members of the working group have any questions on meeting procedures before we continue? Okay, seeing none, let's begin with item number one, and that's going to be our public comments. Um, if working group members would like to offer any comments or questions not on today's agenda, you can raise your hand at this time. Okay. There Barry? are no public comments on this item. Okay, great. Thank you. And then I'll go ahead and start with Mr. Pollard. Oh, so formal. Thank you. Um, let me see. What was I going to talk about? Oh, a um, couple quick announcements. And if you're interested in any of these, contact me after the meeting, okay? Because it's not Sunday related. Um, we've received a grant for the far south border north. It is an art project. 
and we're working with MTS to identify transit stops starting from San Isidro, ending at Linda Vista. So we're gonna take the blue line and the orange line and activate it with our projects. Some of you are gonna be involved in it. I'm not sure yet, I'm working with um, MTS to find out the most active transit stops. And we're looking at four to five to six total. We wanna hit San Isidro, Chula Vista, National City, Southeast San Diego, and we're gonna make an exception for Bayside because they have the same kind of disparities that we have. The only difference is they're north of Bay. They have that same poor population that we're struggling with. So if you're interested, give me a call. I'll keep everybody updated. Real simple process. We're gonna give you some money. We're gonna give you a schedule and activate what you wanna activate in that stop, okay? called the Far Sword Border North, FSBN. That is a piece of something that I, again, like to talk to a lot of folks about is that forming some sort of a coalition for those same communities, because we bid against each other on a lot of grants. So if we could formulate a coalition that applies in unison, that means we will have more access to more money from a state county and federal level, maybe the city, and but you get the idea. Give it some thought, talk to your CEOs and stuff. I've already talked to a few of them already, but keep that in the back of your mind. If you're interested in joining, let us know. We'll have separate meetings to make this happen. But that's gonna change our communities. It's not $20,000 here and $30,000 here that we go spend in various ways. We need to, I think, if there's a value in it, collaborate, and get some real money in our communities. That makes sense? So we'll give it a shot. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other working group members have any other comments? Okay, seeing none, and I believe, Clerk, you mentioned that there weren't any public comments. On the, on I'm sorry. Item one. Two. No, just on item, item one. one. Yeah, yeah, there are no there public weren't. comments on item one. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So just moving on to the next item, which is the approval of the meeting minutes. So that was for the June 22nd working group and the July 27th joint working group meeting minutes. If any of the members have any comments or questions, um, please let me know at this time. All right. Not seeing any. And do we have any comments from the public? Um, there are no public comments on this item. All right, great. And as a reminder, um, you don't have to be present in order to vote on the meeting minutes. So may I have a motion to approve? Motion. Okay, motion by Barry. Second by Rosa. All right. And all those in favor, please raise your hand. Great. That was unanimous. Perfect. So moving on to the next item, which is item number three, and that's just um, an update on key programs, projects, and agency initiatives. So I'd like to thank all of you for your flexibility in moving our meeting time to 9.30. I'm excited to be able to actually stay through the entirety of our discussions um, since I know I've been having to leave for work meetings. Uh, we have we have also confirmed our meeting dates for the rema remainder of the year, and we will keep a November meeting for our working group, but move the date to November 16th since the regularly scheduled meeting would have been on Thanksgiving. And um, I know that for that particular day, unfortunately, I won't be here because I do have another working or sorry, another committee meeting um, that conflicts at that time. So our uh, staff liaison, Paula Zamudio, will be the chair pro tem for the November meeting. And then the December meeting will be canceled and calendar updates will reflect these changes and they'll go out soon to everyone. And again, thank you to everyone for your efforts to spread the word on the regional plan. The mapping tool where members of the community can weigh in on their transportation needs is still up and will remain online through the end of the month. And I know all of our member organizations hosted events and helped with the larger sub-regional events that have taken place the last few months. There are multiple staff members inputting each comment received so they can be synthesized and taken into consideration for the 2025 regional plan. And so with that, I'd like to check in to see if you have any comments, any of the members of the committee. All right, I am not seeing any. Do we have any comments from the public? 
There are no public comments. Okay. All right. Well, we are moving right along to the next item. And that's item number four, and that's the regional safety planning updates. And we will get that update from Sam Sanford and Marissa Mangan of Sandag. I will now hand it over to Sam and Marissa. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having us here today. Oops, we might one presentation prior to this, if we could, please. There we go. Thank you. So uh, we're good now with Vision Zero and Active Transportation Plan. That's the correct PowerPoint. So thanks again for having us here this morning. My name is Sam Sanford. I'm here presenting on Vision Zero Action Plan, and then my colleague Marissa Mangan is presenting on the Regional uh, Active Transportation Plan update. And oftentimes I've come before this group in years past to discuss this federally required safety targets. And this group has asked, okay, we have to set these safety targets, but they're not looking great. It's looking at fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways. And this group rightly has asked, what can we do more? What else can we do? And then we haven't had mechanisms to do much more. But today we're kicking off two planning efforts that are really advancing safety. This Vision Zero Action Plan, which is essentially is a, a comprehensive safety action plan, and then the Active Transportation Plan update, which is largely focused on safety for vulnerable users, cyclists, pedestrians, and, any, and those that are rolling through our transportation system. So I'd like to start by thinking of, of where, what are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to achieve a transportation system that is safe, that everyone, for every trip they take, regardless of the mode or the destination, they get there safe. That's ultimately the goal. The tools we generally have in our, our toolbox to achieve this are projects, policies, and programs. Both these plans that I just mentioned, the Vision Zero Action Plan and the Regional Active Transportation Plan update are going to kind of list off a, a litany of projects, policies, and programs very broadly. And then these plans will also help prioritize those projects to help us achieve those ends to get to that safe transportation system. So a little more detail on the Vision Zero Action Plan. And if we look at news articles, if you've been following this for a while, it's it's not great. You know, during the pandemic, there in some safety circles, there's a big hope that because there, we had a stay at home order, um, people who could work from home, uh, there was less driving. And so the hope was that the number of serious injury and fatality crashes would decrease, but the opposite happened. Part of the reason for that was there was more speeding because there was less congestion. There was also less use use of safety features as people were going through some of the challenges of what was a pandemic and what was perceived as risky. So seatbelt use went down, drunk or in, impaired driving went up, and fatalities and serious injuries went up. As the stay-at-home order ended and commute patterns returned and congestion returned, unfortunately, fatalities and serious injuries stayed high. So some of those additional, those actions of, of speeding, lower seatbelt use, and impaired driving have continued through 2022 and it's estimated to continue through 2023 from preliminary data. Sam, yeah. is that national data or local? National, uh, and I'll get to some of the local data as well. It, the trends hold true. Mm -hmm. This is somewhat of a, an American exceptionalism story where if we look at peers, other nations, and we hold constant population and the amount of driving, the U.S. kind of stands out in fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways, not stand out in a good way. So that is to say there are other approaches, and it doesn't have to be this way. And that's one of the key takeaways for Vision Zero is it does not accept a fatality or serious injury as a cost of using our public transportation roadway system. It doesn't have to be that way. 
For the California, if we look at recent data that's available and considered final, which just goes up to 2020, uh, we can see that it's been increasing. You know, right now I'm showing 10 years of data and it's been steadily increasing. If we put a trend line on this from 2011 to 2020. For the San Diego region, it's very similar. As we get to smaller geographies, we start to see more ups and downs and, and variability in the data, but the trend is still growing. So Sandag was fortunate to be able to receive a grant from the US Department of Transportation called Safe Streets and Roads for All. And in that grant application, we were able to partner with one small city, City of Vista, and also one of our tribes, the La Jolla Band of Los Angeles Indians, to come up with a proposal to develop three comprehensive safety action plans or, or Vision Zero plans. The regional plan will cover the entire transportation system as the public travels it, right? If any of us are walking, biking, driving, we're not thinking about who owns that roadway. Oh, I'm, I'm city of San Diego right now, I'm going into Caltrans and I'm gonna go into the county. We don't, we're not thinking about that as we travel, we just travel. And that's how the regional Vision Zero Action Plan is going to analyze and, and look at crash history and our system for the entire region. Then the city of Vista and the La Jolla Band of Luis Annual Indians is gonna take a deeper dive at their facilities, kind of as examples of what other jurisdictions could do in following this safe systems approach or this Vision Zero Action Plan approach. And there are cities like the city of San Diego already has this kind of work uh, developed and it continues to advance. This would be for some other jurisdictions if they want to go this path and need additional assistance, we'll have examples or templates for them to, to follow. And an additional grant partner is Caltrans, who stepped up in a big way and help, has helped us with their expertise, their knowledge, and also with matching funds for this federal grant. So what will we be getting out of this plan? Uh, some of the key pieces, you know, first and foremost, all, most planning activities start with an existing conditions report. We want to know and better understand where crashes are occurring, what frequency they're occurring at, what are some of the contributing factors, what are the crash types, so rear end crash versus a broadside, we'd have very different treatments for those two different types of crashes. Once we have a good understanding of that base data, then we'll work into something called a high injury network. And I wanted to pause on this one just for a minute. I have an example here from our planning neighbor to the north, the Southern California Association of Governments in LA area. And they have already developed one of these for their region. And the benefit of this tool is it enables a region to focus the finite resources where it really matters. So for the SCAG area and their high injury network, they found that 65% of their fatalities and serious injuries occurred on only 5.5% of their network. They have tens of thousands of miles of roadway. So to know, you know, only 5.5% is where most of the crashes are occurring, then they can really fine tune that approach. In addition to being proactive and identifying areas that are uh, have higher risk for crashes and they can treat those prior to crashes occurring. Third bullet, safety recommendations. So for jurisdictions, this plan will provide a menu of options for different types of safety solutions, depending on what the high injury network and the existing conditions report reveals for that area. A prioritized list of projects, programs, and policies. We're looking not just at projects such as, you know, uh, intersection improvements. We also want to look at policies and what policies could be recommended for re the region wide, for jurisdictions themselves. Uh, and we want to look at project or policies also. Can we recommend things at the state level or at the federal level to improve safety? And then programs. What safety programs or safety enhancing programs could this region benefit from? mini grants for communities to develop uh, tactical urbanism, to demonstration projects, quick builds. This, pro this plan is meant to capture many ideas and then work through a prioritization process on, on what those could be. And then lastly, plan templates, as I mentioned on the prior slide, the templates from Vista and the La Jolla Band of Los Indians as examples for others. 
And I'll pass on to Marissa to go over the Regional Active Transportation Plan. Thank you, Sam. So in parallel with the development of the Vision Zero Action Plan, we're going to be updating our Regional Active Transportation Plan. This is a document that was last developed and adopted in 2010. So we've had three different regional plan adoption cycles come about. There's been changes in the way we plan long range, long term for things like transit, our roadways, and even our bikeway system. And so this is to update and refresh the bikeway network, the regional bike ne bikeway network for um, the San Diego region to make sure that all of our regional destinations our major core commercial areas in our communities, universities, those kinds of big places people are going are fully connected in a safe way. This regional active transportation plan provides the basis for all of the bikeway projects that Sandag plans, designs, and also builds, uh, always in collaboration with our local jurisdictions. They own the roads and uh, with Caltrans, other types of partners. We have an opportunity in updating this plan to, of course, account for all of the changes that have been occurring with regards to travel behavior, desires, and preferences. There's people now very much interested in electric assist bikes or fully electric bikes. There's an interest in being able to carry personal goods or even uh, packages and parcels with e-bikes and those types of electrified options. And we need to ensure that our updated bikeway network uh, accounts for those types of solutions. People now have greater reach with these electrified options and they can go a lot further than before and also faster than uh, traditional biking. And a lot of the bikeway projects that Sandag is thinking about uh, will uh, planning for and building uh, may also include a lot of walkway and pedestrian improvements. There could be bike walk bridges, for example, or walkways built alongside a bike path. And so we're keeping those types of improvements in mind as we update the network. I wanted to share just a couple of maps to kind of show the areas that we're going to be uh, honing in on and keeping in mind, given the adoption of our last regional plan in 2021. That plan had identified an updated transit network, but also regional mobility hub areas. Those mobility hub areas that I hope you are familiar with, or at least recall from the last plan cycle, are the pink areas around the region, about 30 of them, where we assume we want to have a real high saturation of transit services, supporting fleets like microtransit and micromobility. And we wanna make sure that in addition to fully connecting those areas with transit services, that we fully connect them with bikeways and that bikeways that are safe and protected from uh, those driving. Uh, the map on the right shows uh, some data that we've gotten from a source called Replica that shows where shorter trips are ending. Shorter trips under four miles are ending in higher amounts. The darker colors uh, are showing those higher concentrations of shorter trip ends. And those darker colors are overlapping pretty nicely with our identified regional mobility hub network. So it's another opportunity to think about how we can influence or encourage people to consider biking and or walking uh, in lieu of driving for their shorter trips to help with reducing congestion and to help us meet our uh, greenhouse gas reduction uh, target goals. We're thinking about our active transportation network from a, a wide variety of perspectives. Uh, it's gonna, it operates no differently than uh, say a highway network or a transit network where someone could use it to go on a long trip or use it to go on a short trip. You know, just like you get on the freeway for just a couple of exits or ride the bus for a couple of stops, the same is the case for a regional bikeway network with some, some supporting walkway improvements. So there may be long recreational rides or long commute rides that someone could use the bikeway network for, but then also shorter trips to get from uh, one community destination to another. And we wanna make sure that regardless of which part of a bikeway network someone is using, that it is safe for all ages and abilities. So as we're updating the plan, we want to think about a wide variety of, of items in addition to the electrified options like e-bikes and cargo bikes and those types of new ways of uh, moving people and goods. Uh, we wanna make sure we really think beyond just the work trip for the regional bikeway network. There's a lot of different trips that people are taking beyond just commute trips. Those are only comprising about a third of our travel. And there's a lot of opportunity to help uh, encourage folks to consider uh, biking to their destination for those other kind of social or shopping or uh, fun kind of recreational trips, uh, day or night. Uh, we want to identify a lot of the major barriers that are keeping people from walking and biking. That's a lot of good overlap with the safety planning and Vision Zero Action Plan that Sam's leading. What's preventing someone from not even considering biking or walking to their destination today and how, we can, how can we overcome that challenge? 
And we, of course, want to conduct meaningful public engagement that prioritizes underserved communities. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about our, uh, our initial ideas for effective community engagement, because we really want to get your thoughts and input on that. I always forget about these additional photos. Um, we want to leverage a, a diverse set of data for the plan update, uh, given that it's been almost 15 years since the last active transportation plan was developed. There's new information on climate equity, safety, and health data that we want to wrap into the plan to help inform the network development. Because our last regional transportation plan was a real overhaul and a lot of changes had occurred, we need to align our bikeway network with those plan investments. Uh, we want to make sure we consider any of the more kind of local bikeway and walkway connections that our cities have adopted into their community plans. You know, integrate that into the regional network. Consider if there's any uh, connections that right now are considered local. Actually elevate those to be more regional connections and help comprise a regional network that can ensure that we're fully connected. And just like the Vision Zero Action Plan, we also are responsible for coming up with a list of projects and phasing and coming up with implementation assumptions and considerations. This is going to really drive the order in which Sandag uh, implements projects, seeks uh, either our local transnet dollars to help fund those or grant funds from the state and or federal level to help fund those projects for the years to come. And uh, we'll also have supporting programs and policies and ways to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of those investments. And the last bullet is uh, kind of a nod to what we're currently working on, which is considering, given that our 2025 regional plan is being developed right now in parallel with these two plans, what could we consider as a potential interim active transportation network for the plan so that we don't adopt a 2025 regional plan that still has that 2010 bikeway network assumed? So we're kind of working through what could be some kind of interim network before we um, adopt and finalize the regional active transportation plan in the same year, 2025. Moving on to engagement uh, ideas and opportunities, in addition to providing uh, regular updates to Sandag working groups like this one, uh, we want to you know, really lean in to uh, digital platforms and digital outreach as one way to collect information. Very similar to how the regional plan right now has an interactive mapping component up and maybe some surveying that's gonna happen. We're gonna do the same thing. We wanna be able to have people pinpoint uh, where they might wanna see improvements in new investments. Uh, we're going to have tens and tens and tens of in-person public events. Uh, some of those are going to be done in coordination with community-based organizations that we've been executing some contracts with and we appreciate that assistance. Uh, we wanna be able to go to those communities and listen and hear about the challenges and opportunities that they see with regards to active transportation. Uh, we wanna go hard with social media and have engaging content to get people to uh, reply to our reels and stories and give us their ideas and, and do all of that. Uh, and then we've also formed a technical advisory group um, that we'll talk about in a moment. But before Sam talks about that group, wanted to just remind folks of how the digital platform that we have for the regional plan looks for the interactive mapping component. We wanna mimic this type of uh, platform to be able to have people pin and identify specific locations where they either feel unsafe biking or walking, where they uh, really do desire uh, a new bikeway or walkway connection. Uh, you know, we can of course have folks leave comments, upload photos, like or dislike other people's comments. And it's a really helpful tool, uh, one of many that we'll be planning on using for uh, the updates of both plans. And then, of course, we want to make sure we uh, consider um, equity as far as our engagement is concerned. We want to make sure that the way in which we're outreaching to communities is truly and genuinely inclusive. Uh, we want to get creative with the ways in which we're trying to reach communities. We don't only want to rely on the digital platform. We don't want to have kind of stale, boring in-person events. We want them to be engaging and we want people to come out uh, over and over or even once if they just have that time to uh, tell us their ideas and um, be part of the process informing uh, the development of both plans. We really want to emphasize the value of lived experience as part of the data collection. Not all of the data we're looking at needs to or should just be quantitative in nature. That only gets us so far. And so we have some ideas for how we can activate some spaces, integrate some storytelling aspects and collect narratives uh, and add into anecdotes, so to speak, with regards to how people are feeling with regards to biking and walking and safety. 
uh, and it's our opportunity to expand uh, the definition of equity priority communities. And when, by, by that, I mean in our regional plan, for example, we uh, prioritize and produce maps and collect data around lower income, people of color, and senior communities. There's other communities that we need to also keep in mind and um, put at the forefront with the development of these plans, uh, single parent households, uh, folks that have disabilities, folks that have maybe a lower level of education achieved, uh, rent burden households, all of those types of populations that we can consider in addition to our core three groups that our regional transportation plan always prioritizes. Uh, and it's our opportunity as we're thinking about the implementation and phasing of projects for safety and active transportation to prioritize those historically underserved communities and uh, have that play a big role in the prioritization and phasing of projects. I'll hand it over to Sam for the tag update. Thank you. Yeah, as mentioned in one of the prior slide, slides, we have this technical advisory group, and this is one of the best practices that Sandaz experienced with, but also that came out of the U.S. Department of Transportation, that you get a multidisciplinary group to help advise the development of these plans. So we have one joint technical advisory group that consists of community-based organizations, school districts, first responders, trauma centers, uh, jurisdictions, tribes. It's a very diverse group. And we had our first meeting this week. It was, uh, I think, a, a huge success where we were able to share ideas about the plan and then get feedback about those ideas and ways forward. And this one was particularly about engagement. But as we move forward through this planning process, we'll reconvene this group approximately quarterly and share ideas and get their feedback from this diverse group that's more than just traditional transportation planning. So they have insights into other areas as well that can help benefit these plans. Behind both plans is data. And so behind the scenes for the last year and a half or so, there's been concerted effort in gathering crash data or safety data to help inform both these plans. And that's culminating into a safety data dashboard. And this is a screenshot of uh, one of the iterations of it. I don't know, this will be the final view of what it looks like, but this is set to launch uh, later this fall, publicly available. It'll have filters and obviously a map interface where the public and jurisdictions can go in and they can do a quick analysis or quick review of how their neighborhood, their area is doing, what are the maybe the crash types that are problematic in their community and be informed on that. For the jurisdictions, this can be helpful for quick grant applications, which often require information about uh, frequency of, of crashes, the types of crashes. They can go in, do a filter by jurisdiction and crash type and, and pull that information relatively quickly. The idea behind this also came from a, a bit of data consistency, where there is one set of data for the entire region that uh, jurisdictions can use. And also, as opposed to having every jurisdiction download a, a statewide integrated uh, traffic database and doing analysis and cleaning up of it, uh, we had one source for all the jurisdictions to use, as opposed to the 18 cities, the county, and the 17 tribes doing it separately. So now it's, it's one tool that all can use uh, for their benefit. A little bit on timeline, on, on next steps. So the high injury network will be working diligently through along with additional safety analysis this fall. Uh, the draft regional active transportation network is set to be done this or next spring. The regional vision zero action plan is also set to be completed next spring. And then the stakeholder outreach is throughout this entire process as Marissa went through all, all the outreach elements that we're working on. On the vision zero action plan, Spring of 2024 is, is a pretty quick time frame, And the reason for that is it enables jurisdictions and tribes to apply for a funding source uh, that same year. So there's kind of a time frame on that one. We're completing that work and then we'll continue to advance it over the next several months beyond that time frame. But we wanna make sure that the cities, tribes and county can apply for safe streets and roads for all because a county wide or sorry a region wide plan makes all the jurisdictions eligible and that concludes our presentation and we're happy to take any questions you may have great thank you and thanks for the presentation do any working group members have any questions or comments 
Sure, Rosa. Yeah, I just have a couple of questions. Um, on that regional vision and zero action plan, on that screenshot with the SAG, I guess, I didn't quite understand that when you said something about 60% and only 5.5 was in that their transportation of jurisdiction. I wasn't sure. Could you explain that a little bit further, please? Yeah, so the idea of the high injury network is you look at your entire network. So for San Diego region, it's about 17,000 miles of roadway. For the Southern California Association of Governments, it's much larger because it is, I believe, five counties, Orange, LA County, Imperial County, Riverside County. I'm forgetting another one. San Bernardino, thank you. Um, so an immense area. And in order to focus their resources, they developed that high injury network to find out where on those roadways crashes were most frequently happening. And that's where they were able to identify that 65% of their fatals and serious injury crashes occur on only 5.5% of that entire network. So they can kind of, if that helps. Barry? So those 5.5% of where most of the accident happened, are they in underserved communities? A and B, do you expect it to change that much? I mean, I sort of expect that to be a consistent sort of 5% because, does that make sense? Is it in underserved communities generally, 5.5%? And did that number surprise you? So I'm interested to see what it'll be for our region because yeah. um, we're still talking about the example from the LA area Thanks. for our area. And, and we know nationally uh, that underserved communities are disproportionately represented in crash stats. Right? There are higher severity, more frequent crashes in uh, low income areas and areas with minority populations. That's a lot of history of planning that goes in into what we are experiencing today. And so, as Marissa was mentioning on the social equity side, that'll come into part of the prioritization process to help with that. That is kind of a known concern. We, we can't quantify it yet. That'll come out with the existing conditions report, but as one area that we're excited to dive into. Yeah, I was thinking that since Skag already did it, right, up in LA, what did their numbers indicate? I can get back to you on it, I don't know. Part of that is Watts, is, is East LA. I mean, let us know what, yeah. What the trend is that would be interesting i mean don't spend a lot of time on it just do a quick glance because i'm sure they outlined where where the issues are in the communities yeah if you see some sort of a trend yeah that would be interesting because i would be willing to bet that that trend is going to be some similar to down here the numbers are going to change mm -hmm. but those percentages are going to probably be pretty consistent yeah. yes gladly and i got a bunch of other questions but i want these guys did i get to your question so. Yeah, you did. I had another question. That's, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> now, the age range, I didn't see any type of data for age range as far as, you know, that. And as far as the accidents, did it give indication as far as were they um, health reasons that they, you know, they got in a crash or was it because of their, you know, inability to see? So I didn't see those data if that, if, if that matters. But it, I mean, it's all safety factor and solve crash. So it, if you can maybe put that in the the the, the spool of things as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from any of the other? Sure, Barry. So when when you guys plan like for the future of services and resources and the hubs and those kind of positions. Can you give me a little more insight how you deal with the local issues that's gonna affect that area? Let me give you a specific question. The Euclid. Barry, can we ask you to speak into your mic, please? Sorry to interrupt. Usually so loud. And that better? Okay. So using that little area, Market Street and and uh, Euclid, there's a whole lot of development going on that's not there now. And I know the last regional plan, there was a question about using that as a true hub. How do you determine that? Because I see things that are different than what you guys are, are seeing. You know what I mean? So how is that considered? And is that reliable? And 
real time? I mean, give me some idea because I don't see the connection. I, I mean, I see all the development, but I don't see any change. I see long lines and long Euclid and long lines, and, uh, and I know what it's going to look like, right? So we all see that traffic coming, but I don't see any transportation changes to prepare for all of those increase of traffic. Right. That makes sense? It does. We have to take into account kind of a land use compatibility, if, you, if I can use that term. Where do you get that information from here? Is that um, work, working with our local jurisdictions to find out beyond what they maybe planned for growth, what's actually happening now so that we're not shortchanging the communities with the transportation investments, whether they're active transportation or transit or otherwise, to go along with it. We don't want a complete street without any land use that supports it, and we don't want it the other way around, like right. you're talking with a boom in development, but still an auto-oriented kind of experience. And so we'll definitely include as part of our bike and bikeway and walkway planning efforts, a land, what I call a land use compatibility assessment to try to figure out what's now going on now and in the near future for development that's actually permitted and happening because it's bringing more people, not just living or working, but visiting and shopping there. And what can we do, at least from the bikeway perspective, to reprioritize the phasing list and project list to get it more in line where those things are happening? Um, I think we can do our best to also help influence how the transit planning works because in an ideal world in where we have kind of on-street bikeways specifically and bus services that we're planning for rapid items, we should be bundling them together to work together. Maybe they're not always on the same road, but they're serving the community and we want to be able to try our best to try to link the prioritization and implementation of both rapid bus and bikeway planning together so that people have the option of using both and they get and then they get the added benefit of having the double, double, double connectivity of both of those options. So on these community level projects, can we give you information on maybe people that are more on the ground, like we've sure, got a yeah. planning group, even though they've lost a lot of teeth with their, you know, they're just another CBO now. Yeah. Ours still pretty much focuses on that. So I'd like to give you a name of somebody when you deal with Southeast. It's just the planning group, Sally Small. Is okay. And us, of course, residents and include them. That'd be great. And I think it will lend well to a conversation, maybe use that area perhaps as a, mm -hmm. Please Test do. case Please regarding do. how we consider a more locally planned bikeway project and trying to elevate it to the regional network because we feel like it warrants that inclusion in the regional connectivity. There could be a bikeway that the city of San Diego has planned on a in a document way out far far out into the future. And maybe we want to bring it into the regional network and figure out a way to collaborate with them and move up the implementation. Gotcha. as an example. Yeah, that's but that's idea. those are discussions we're going to have to start having with every local city regarding what you've already planned and how we can include it in the regional network. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> I know it's going to be hard, but. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Jesse. Yeah, it's Mike. I guess my is more of a comment, not a question. I think uh, this project is very, very exciting, right? Um, uh, I think us as uh, community-based organizations, we work with communities that have a lot of folks who cycle, walk, and we see, right, a lot of accidents. The data shows it. And I think this project is really exciting because it's going to be able to really hone in where a lot of these fatalities are, are happening and put us in a position where we can, you know, go after funds to actually do something about it and, and you know, solve this issue. So uh, really, really excited about this. I'm um, looking forward to getting another update, so maybe in a few months from you guys. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Claire? <laughs> not here at home. Um, I ran across two companies that had some marvelous ideas about transportation improvements. One's in France and the other is in Germany. The company name is Colas Ideas, C-O-L-A-S. Okay. Look at this when you got nothing to do. Great ideas um, with um, what to do with streets and, and just real creative stuff. Um, the other is something called the Easy Go Renault, Renault, you know, the car. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they've got these cars, and I thought of this because of the microtransit. 
take a look at those. It's called Easy Go, and the name and the style of the car is R E N A U L T. Have you seen them? No, I know Renault, but I'll look yeah. at Easy Go. Check them out. They're really fun to look at. And if we could get those like a pilot program to check that out, I mean, you'll see. You'll love it. I guarantee you. I was on it, I was on it for about an hour last night. And I was like, that's cool. That's cool. That's wow. cool. All right. All that stuff. So good luck. Claire. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the updates. My question is kind of like building on Barry's previous one about kind of what's happening locally. Um, and this may just be me not really knowing about how the process works, but I'm curious, you know, when you're looking like really locally um, at potential bikeway projects, you know, how does the process work with collaborating with local jurisdictions when we're thinking about what their, you know, plan, what their like current and future plans are, and then the the regional plan and then bringing them all together and then how, you know, how we prioritize and uplift projects and communities um, that really, you know, need to be prioritized for like funding and resources, like through, you know, at the SANDAG level, SANDAG regional level and the local level, if that makes sense, kind of like how that process plays out. I mean, it's a complicated process that even I don't know everything about, but I'll say this in that we have to do our best even at the regional plan level every four years to try to get a sense and gauge where each of the local jurisdictions are with planning for a wide variety of things, land use and transportation. And everyone's on a different timeline. Some communities have had a community plan updates, others are decades behind, and there's that to keep in mind. Some communities have been fortunate enough to implement projects and others haven't had that happen yet. And when we are speaking from the bikeway planning perspective for the regional network, we want to be able to take a fresh look and determine based on the quantitative and the qualitative data that we've collected and all the input to define a network and elevate some of the local projects potentially to the regional network and see how that can influence how the local cities then do what they can to align and implement the more locally connecting projects. We can't force anybody to do anything, but we can maybe hope that the regional network as it's updated is a catalyst or a, a point of influence for how other projects can align. It's never going to be perfect. They're never going to be great, perfect timelines, even with land use, transportation, all of it. But it's one way, just like when how we plan our uh, transit long term, we can use this regional network as a way to also influence alignment locally. I feel like that's the best way I can answer that um, and, and helping to encourage and influence because we want to be progressive and kind of go hard on transportation safety for people outside of cars. And that kind of network, whether it's a bus network or a bikeway network, can help influence changes locally for connections and alignment and phasing and timing. Thank you. Yeah, Faye. Um, this is just a question. A very, I'm just curious. Does the safety plan also include potential safety, like cyber attacks, bomb threats? Do you factor those in in your plans? So on. Technological safety, we usually we have a section within our regional plan that addresses that. That's going to be a little bit separate from this effort for Vision Zero, which is going to be more on traffic safety. Uh, but we do have a, an appendix to the 21 plan, and we'll be updating it for the 25 plan on technological safety and security. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, not seeing any from the working group members. Can we check in to see if we have any comments from the public? Thank you, Chairwoman. We have one public commenter, it's virtual. Um, and I would just like to clarify for the public commenter that this is the regional state safety planning updates item, specifically on the regional vision zero action plan and regional active transportation plan. Um, and the commenter is the original draw, please go ahead. I know what the agenda item's about. Uh, it's the problem is, is that this is all about safety and nowhere do you guys mention anything about the dangers of these lithium batteries that are, you know, like basically a bomb. That's the bomb threat you should be concerned about uh, because these are, I mean, even the city council in San Diego had a meeting about it, which was disturbing because it's like, we're going to tell people that these can combust and that, you know, we need to worry about people recycling lithium batteries because we've lost $2 million in trash trucks, but it's never about getting them off the roads. It's like, if two cars that are electric 
crash into each other. They're basically blow up and keep blowing up. And nobody ever talks about that. Then it releases a bunch of toxic gases. And like everything that you guys want to do for net zero is BS. I mean, we don't even talk about the charging stations when they are um, hooked up to the vehicle, probably let alone just the vehicle alone, puts off immense amounts of radiation. So it's like you want to sit here on one hand and act like you're talking about safety and like road traveling crashes and stuff. But how many of them have been in an electric vehicle? How many of them have blown up? And, you know, we want people to be riding in these buses or, you know, all of the transportation it being electric. And those are literally bombs on the road. And people are worried, like worried about, you know, losing two million dollars in trash trucks. But we're not concerned about the human lives that are going to be riding these or near these. You know, I mean, you never talk about the real stuff or the fact that, you know, um, there will never be zero emissions. Regardless, it's this is seriously about safety. And I just don't understand why none of you ever acknowledge that, why you won't, you know, bring that up as an item. Let's talk about lithium batteries and how toxic they are and dangerous. They're not safe. And th if you have all of those on the road and then you have like a massive pile up, I mean, are you guys going to be content knowing that a bunch of people blew up or if they just they start on fire, they can't even put out these fires. I don't understand how if we have all of these vehicles on the road and there's a fire hazard where the fire trucks only carry 500 gallons of water and you need tens of thousands of gallons of water to put one of them out. And we want people to be riding on all these scooters and micro mobility and electric bikes. I mean, do you understand what you're doing? You're literally put, setting people up to be put in danger and you won't even tell them about those dangers. It makes no sense to me how you can sit up there and do that and then act like, you know, it's crazy for someone like me to call in and and urge you to look into it and do something if you're going to sit here and talk about safety. It's ridiculous because you're literally putting people in danger by not telling them the truth. That's very negligent. I don't understand. Thank you. Your time expired. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. All right. We will now move on to item five, and that's the vehicle emission vehicle program development. And we have Samaya Alder from Sandag who will present an overview of the vehicle emission vehicle incentive program and seek input on its proposed engagement plan. I will now hand it over to Samaya. Alrighty. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Samaya. I am a regional planner on the climate team. Um, for those that might not know, the climate team here at Sandag includes climate adaptation, um, action, and resilience planning, but we also have our clean transportation work within that team. So that's what I'm here to talk about today, specifically our zero emission vehicle incentive program that we're currently in the process of designing. Um, so we brought this item to the CBO outreach team in August, and I think some of the same folks that were in that meeting are here today, so I apologize if at any point this is repetitive, but um, since then we have made progress. We've developed our draft outreach and engagement plan, and we're also in the process of planning our first public outreach effort in a couple of weeks here, so um, more to share on that today. Uh, but again, just to uh, reframe the discussion. Today we're talking about uh, community engagement specifically for designing this program. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so just a quick project overview. Uh, what is a zero emission vehicle? So for this program, it'll include two types of electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, which is um, the common type of EV that you might think of where you plug into a traditional charging station. It also includes fuel cell electric vehicles, which are powered by hydrogen fueling stations. Um, so both types uh, will be included under this program. And a zero emission vehicle incentive program is a greenhouse gas reduction measure in the 2021 regional plan in the sustainable community strategy. So this work is directly related to implementing the 21 plan. Um, and our goal is to support the purchase of 100,000 zero emission vehicles by 2035. And our expected program launch is in 2025. So within that 10 year period, we're looking at incentivizing 100,000 zero emission vehicles. 
This program is specifically focused on passenger or light duty vehicles, um, so kind of your average household car. Um, and to align with that, we're really prioritizing equity um, and community engagement as we design it. Uh, we're really trying to kind of close the gap and meet people who have not been able to um, participate in other state programs or other types of incentive programs. Um, so that's our focus for this regional uh, program. So looking at a timeline and kind of an overview of the tasks that we'll be completing to uh, through November of next year to design this program, um, we're looking at conducting community and stakeholder engagement kind of throughout the duration of the project. But of course, we'll be aligning with some of these major deliverables. So um, for example, a program strategy, we're planning to start work on that later this year. Um, and following that, we'll have an implementation plan. One of our first steps, though, before we get to that is to develop this outreach and engagement plan, which, as I mentioned, we now have a draft of. Um, and I want to note, of course, that we'll be coming back to this group as well as the CBO outreach team and other groups here at Sandag and also externally to share on these other deliverables. So going back to our outreach and engagement plan specifically, I wanted to talk about a few of the key elements in the plan. Um, and as I mentioned, since uh, August, when we were at the CBO outreach team, we have more specifics to share, so I'll be able to speak to those today. So for audiences, um, we want to engage with both EV and equity stakeholders, um, and that will kind of span different types of groups. So some of the ones that we've called out already in our plan, and this is just an example list, but um, of course our community-based organizations throughout the region, um, community groups, community planning groups included, tribal nations, um, our local governments and state agencies and other types of public agencies like the transit operators in our region, We'll also be coming back to the Sandag Board of Directors, Policy Advisory Committees, and our working groups. So again, Social Equity Working Group and CBO Outreach Team especially. And then on the industry side, which is kind of a unique point of engagement for this project, uh, we're looking at engaging car dealership associations and mobility companies like Uber and Lyft to understand how um, this program will uh, complement their work. So that's kind of on the stakeholder side. And then for public stakeholders and outreach, um, we're starting to brainstorm the best way to do that. We are looking at perhaps like a sub-regional approach. Um, so I would really welcome any comments or feedback you might have on that. And we're also looking uh, at our options to partner with the CBOs and other types of groups to help spread the word and gather the input that we need to make this program successful. So I'm gonna pause there and see if there are any comments on the audience's aspect of our plan. Okay, good. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move on to kind of the other side of our outreach and engagement plan. This is on methods and strategies. So since August, we've developed a couple of key strategies um, that we've named in the plan. So the first of which is to develop accessible materials and content. Um, we're going to le leverage and follow Sandag agency-wide best practices. So complying with the language assistance plan and making sure um, kind of looking at a procedural equity perspective, making sure that our material is in uh, print and digital versions wherever possible and kind of having all those different types of ways to engage for um, different types of folks and their backgrounds. In our draft plan, um, another one of our strategies is to proactively collaborate with and involve disadvantaged and low-income communities. Um, again, trying to solve the needs or solve the gap um, that have other programs have not met there. So um, one of the methods to do that is to leverage existing networks and we're very conscious of the fact that um, people generally have a lot going on. So we don't want to add too much of an additional engagement burden on people. So leveraging, um, as I mentioned previously, the working groups, committees, and all the work that's being done in the region. We also want to share information with the public and maintain transparency as to how we're developing and designing this program and what the reasoning is behind that. So some of our methods for targeted public outreach are to intend um, in-person events as available. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we're in the process of planning that first outreach event. So it's in a couple of weeks on October 14th. It'll be EV Day here in San Diego at Snapdragon, if anyone is interested. Um, we'll have a booth there and we're uh, planning to share about this program and see what kind of early feedback we can get. And then in addition to in-person events, we'll be doing online 
information sharing through social media, website content, and other resources to reach kind of that broad region-wide audience. So if there are any comments on methods and strategies, I'd be happy to take those now, or we can keep going and go to the end. Barry? You have me in a talkative mood this morning. All these, it's really good information. Can we put a section of this outreach and engagement into the high schools? I don't know what that looks like, but even start getting these issues that would probably be more effective if we started at a younger age with their education, their awareness, what does SANDAG do? How do these, you know, you know what I'm saying. I mean, it just, let's try to get a little deeper in to the community. So 10 years from now, we're not having the same conversation, but we've got more, ed, you know, more planners of color for one, right? And then give them some idea on how this happens, but just start it early, just not in general. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting to see how partnering with academia, both at the college and the high school level, um, will affect kind of behavior trends for vehicle purchases. Well, you know it's going to improve it no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. You're giving more information. Use junior achievement as a way to get into these schools. Right? I love junior achievement. Yeah, yeah that's a great that's, idea. Well, they're already in. So all you got to do is piggyback to start with a module with JA and then build on it. But that's really neat, and that's all over this place. I mean, we need to get this stuff down so more people are paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. you know? That's all. Yeah, thank you. That's a great idea. So with that, um, talking about our next steps, we're going to research existing incentive programs to see kind of what practices are already out there, uh, what seems to be a best practice, and what we may or may not want to take and bring to our region for this program. We've already started doing that actually this past month, and we've had some really uh, fruitful and interesting discussions with program administrators around the state and around the country to learn what they're already doing. Um, and then, as I mentioned, this is currently a draft plan, but we'll be finalizing and formalizing that in the next couple of weeks. And then, again, repeating that, uh, we'll be coming back to this group and others to continually provide updates and seek input as we design the program. So really looking forward to that. And that concludes my presentation. So there's my email. Um, I would really welcome any comments or follow-up feedback you might have. And at any point, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, but I think that's it for now. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for the presentation. Any other questions or comments from the working group members? Rosa? I, I don't remember, did you put a timeline on where you're gonna come up with all this? I couldn't, I don't recall that. Yes, I will yeah. go back to that. Okay. So yeah, the project should be complete, um, this planning and design phase in November or December of next year. And then the program will launch and be open for, for rebates or incentives in 2025. And what was the amount as far as the incentive? Do you have a, uh, an amount, a grant on that? Um, we haven't determined that yet, but that's one of the, the big research points of this design phase is figuring out what does that amount need to be? Um, what should the set-asides look like for disadvantaged, low-income, and moderate households? Um, and we've we've we did that for our EV charger rebate program and saw a lot of interest and um, a lot of the funds going to um, disadvantaged, low and moderate income families. So or areas. So we're hoping to um, see that level of success again. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Bella. Good morning, thank you for the presentation. I would just like to hear your perspective on the concerns raised earlier regarding the safety of lithium batteries and electric vehicles. Yeah, um, I'm not personally an expert on lithium batteries, but I know that our team is closely following kind of the state and federal research that's coming out and they're continuing to do. Um, for example, I know the California Energy Commission is repeatedly funding lithium uh, battery research, so recycling, improved safety procedures, things like that around battery use. Um, and I know uh, the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, has recently published some guidelines and safety uh, 
procedures for zero emission buses. So I know our local transit operators are looking at that as well. So we're following closely with what um, any new research or findings are. And in general, um, technology continues to evolve. So I think um, it'll just continue to get better and better. Thank you. So your program will take safety into account, I assume? Yeah. Like it's looking at this part of the metrics of how you're going to promote it and why you're going to promote it? Yes. Yeah. Part of um, designing this program, uh, so with our program strategy and the implementation plan, uh, specifically the implementation plan, we'll look at how are we spreading the word about this program? Is there a consumer outreach element that's needed, um, which th there surely will be? Um, so kind of addressing those concerns um, and providing information so that people can make informed decisions really is the core of it. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then Jesse. Thank you so much for this presentation. My question lies on charging these electric um, cars and vehicles, especially the huge trucks that they're planning to launch. Um, I'd like to talk about, is it part of your plan, the land utilization and how they are planning to um, allocate certain lands for charging this huge trucks, because it will take tons and tons of parcels of land to do that. And there has be, been a way to do some cost benefit analysis on this that will affect um, socially, social outcomes for our communities. Yeah, um, we have a project um, called the Medium and Heavy Duty Zero Emission Vehicle Blueprint. Um, that one looks in pretty close detail at different types of scenarios for charging and what the infrastructure needs will look like, including the land footprint. Um, so I'm not sure what um, the siting criteria look like specifically, but I'd be happy to share that with you. In general, um, we're trying to focus charging where the operations are already happening so that we're not kind of expanding that footprint. Um, with that too, kind of the other side of that is the electrical demand. So we're trying to understand where any upgrades or increased electrical capabilities will be needed and focusing in certain areas. Thank you, and Jesse. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. I guess I had a, a very similar uh, question. Um, I'm just wondering too, like, cause I'm, it looks, from what you share that this project is still like kind of like open-ended, right? Like kind of determining like the goals and like how much funding is needed. Um, but I'm thinking like, are is this project taking into consideration also like charging infrastructure? Um, Cause I'm thinking, right, if you guys are incentivizing like electric vehicles, um, there already exists, right? Like uh, electric electrical vehicle uh, charging infrastructure, but we might be in a situation where um, folks might have to drive more to charge their cars, which would be doable. But you know, I think as a uh, our region is really trying to um, reduce vehicles miles travels, right? And if we were incentivizing folks um, and not having the appropriate infrastructure, we might actually be increasing like the amount that driving, the amount of driving that folks have to do. So I don't know if this uh, project is taking that into consideration. Definitely. Um, I think I briefly mentioned earlier that we also have an EV charger rebate program. And the first phase of that is kind of uh, closing out or we're no longer accepting applications for that. So we're starting to think about what phase two will look like. And I think it's going to be the perfect opportunity to align it with the needs of people as they adopt electric vehicles through this program. So um, I guess no specific answer yet, but I think it's definitely the timing is working out really well to do that. Great, thank you. Jennifer? So I have a question about the EV rebate. Is that for people to charge at home, uh, an incentive to be able to use their own electricity to charge their vehicle, or is it elsewhere? So um, the first phase of our program was for more like workplace charging for businesses and public spaces like a city hall or a park or something to install charging. Um, we are looking at opportunities for home charging and how to expand access to that, especially with this program. And I know um, we also partner with a couple of other organizations like scg &E has the Power Your Drive program that I think is for home charging, multifamily housing, et cetera. Any other questions or comments from the working group members? Barry? EV chargers. Um...
lot of communities don't even have them. A lot of communities don't even have the infrastructure to have them, to support them. A lot of them are using old copper wires and not fibers in the infrastructure. I love all these ideas, but when are you gonna put the foundation equal? When are you gonna let those communities that don't have those things have it so when you make adjustments, we can all be lifted? And, I, and I'm just saying this is in Southeastern, but God knows in San Ysidro and Chula Vista, National City and City Heights, they got all these issues. So you still got a big have and have nots issue going on. Is there a, a inventory of the level of infrastructure in the city or in these communities to give you a baseline to work with? Because we don't know, we don't have that stuff until we get a CMO contract for microtransit. Mm -hmm. And then we say, okay, we got the contract, CMO, good, good, good. Then we got electric cars and let's go plug them in. There's no chargers. How embarrassing is that? And then we look and try to get the chargers and we find out we don't have the infrastructure to support the chargers. And this is just class two. They're not class sixes and the DC thing. That, those are basic class two stuff. So I would be really in favor of some sort of plan to get all these communities up to speed before you do these other things. This is what equity is about prioritizing the communities that need it the most. So I'm going to tell you ahead of time, if I see a whole lot of money being dumped up north, you're going to hear about it. <laughs> it's just, let's balance this out. Let's, let's, let's do this. And we can help you do this because we can help you identify those areas that we really need it. Because I'm not trusting the city coming back with that information. They haven't yet. They allowed it to get the way it is now. So what makes me think they're going to come to the rescue and fix this? But somebody's got to pay attention to it. And we can't keep talking about it every month. So that might mean a change in priorities. That might mean, heaven forbid, a budget, a budget alteration to fix what's wrong in our communities. That I haven't seen. I love the fact that your con your conversation is about prioritizing our areas. Let's put some teeth in it. Mm -hmm. Now I am done. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions or comments? Rose? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just have a, a question and a concern that, you know, um, with the rising costs of utilities, people are, it's really getting crazy. And, you know, we're talking about incentivizing and possibly having, you know, families that are are charging in their own homes. Utility costs are nuts. You know, we, we you know, working in Linda Vista, we have so many people coming in looking for help with that. So I'm just wondering how that would even be, you know, involved with this. I don't know if that's a whole other can of worms about utility costs. But... Yeah, um, it is definitely a challenge that I think we'll need to better understand and then work through, through this uh, period. Um, we have a pretty good working relationship with scg &E, so I think part of the implementation plan and the strategy will be understanding preemptively kind of what that will realistically look like. Um, and we've had a lot of discussions too internally about kind of the, the consumer, going back to the consumer education and outreach portion, um, making sure folks understand like what the life cycle of owning an EV really looks like and kind of what the differences are between your traditional gas powered vehicle. Um, so that is part of it, like the cost of fueling and powering your vehicle. Um, so it's something that we'll look at and coordinate with SCG on as much as we can. Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, not seeing any. So I'm gonna to turn to the clerk to see if we have any public comments for this agenda item. Thank you, Chairwoman. We have one public commenter, the original draw. Please go ahead. 
Man, this is so disturbing to listen to you guys, you know, try and explain your your way around all of this like BS. I mean, first of all, there will never be zero emissions. All of the things and the technologies that you want to use for zero emissions cost a lot. They have a lot of GHGs that they create just in the creation of them. And like diesel fuel and a bunch of water like all this stuff that you you want to act like they're if you don't have like and it's not fossil fuels it's uh, fossil or like yeah oil it's like from the earth and it comes up abundantly just like the water there's not a scarcity to it and it's not from fossils anyway um you will never make any kind of zero energy anything without using oil and other means so at what point i mean it, you can't just get rid of them and do that but regardless um you know you guys sit here and you don't even know like anything about the lithium batteries but you want to say that you're getting information you know from other people and that you're so sure on it but you guys need to actually do your own research on the lithium batteries because not only are they toxic to the environment and the people who the kids who mine for it and the cobalt and it will kill animals if they touch a leach field that has lithium in it. You won't even, you know, educate yourself on that to know that these are literally bombs that we're putting people in and you're incentivizing them to get into it. And not only that, the power grid can't handle all of that infrastructure that you want to add. And many times that these people are having these little electric chargers, they have a diesel generator hooked up to it. So how green is that, right? I mean, everything is a bunch of smoke and mirrors. You don't have the infrastructure that if to incentivize these people with to even go drive that way. People have reach anxiety because they can't make it to a charger in these vehicles. And not only that, depending on the weather, whether it's hot or cold, you lose the amount of uh, miles that you can go because the battery is, it fluctuates how much energy it's going to put off. So it's a bunch of BS what you're telling people. And you want to go into schools, which is even more terrifying, and tell them more lies about climate change. That is BS. Because everything this is based off of is a lie. You want to talk about health and safety, but nobody wants to talk about that there's actually chemicals being sprayed on us from the sky or that these things that you want to engage in are toxic. Because if this was a gas vehicle that would just blow up, which, I mean, they can, but they've made them pretty well over the last however many years, right? They don't, but you would get it off the road. You wouldn't incentivize people to drive in it. And plus, you can drive a car with water. Why don't we look into that? As opposed to all of these things that are literally toxic that you don't even know about. But Your time expired and that concludes the public commenters. All right. Thank you. And thanks for the presentation. Moving on to item six is the EPA Regional Climate Action Planning Grant. And so that'll be from Susan Friedman, who will present information on this planning grant and opportunities to coordinate with your organizations in future climate efforts. So I'll go ahead and hand that over to Susan. Great, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to be here today to kick off a discussion on something new for SANDAG, which will be developing a regional climate action plan. Uh, we'll actually be doing this in two parts, uh, one that's happening over the next five months, and then a more comprehensive climate action plan uh, that will be part of the 2025 regional plan. Uh, this is in your agenda. Uh, what the board approved at their September 8th meeting was accepting this Environmental Protection Agency grant of $1 million for a four-year project. And I'm going to describe a little bit about that, but it also includes some budget for working with and having for CBOs to be doing engagement and community over this four-year period. And we'd love to get some initial feedback before we develop an engagement plan. So I think that was kind of a common theme today, too. Uh, so, first, a, a bit of an overview of this. It's EPA calls it their climate pollution reduction grants. It's one grant that came into Sandag, three de deliverables over four years. The first part is this near-term effort called a Priority Climate Action Plan, or PCAP. Uh, it is due to EPA on March 1st. 
The focus is near term, meaning in the next five years, likely priority measures that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and it's a prerequisite for some much bigger pot of funding that's competitive coming up that I'll talk about in a future slide. The next piece of this is developing a comprehensive cap, uh, which will be due in a couple of years from now in summer 2025. Uh, and this will be near-term and long-term measures. It'll be a brand new looking at um, where our emissions are coming from in the region, and it's gonna be tied to the 2025 regional plan. And then finally, less flashy is just some update reports at the end of the project, really to see what progress has been achieved in the PCAP and CCAP over this time frame. But getting into the, this is the detail slide, so sorry for it being really busy. But what we've got are those columns. The, the second column is the PCAP and what we have to do. The middle is the comprehensive cap that's part of the regional plan and, and the status report at the end. But really just looking at um, with the priority cap, uh, these are things, so it's not the same as a local government's climate action plan. It's a little different, especially at this priority cap section. We don't need to cover everything, and that's because EPA is just awarding these contracts, and the project is due March 1st, 2024. So it doesn't give us much time to get a lot done. The purpose is to build on our local government's existing climate action action plans, as well as the county's regional decarbonization framework, and hear from communities what their priorities are in this area. Uh, so with the regional greenhouse gas inventory, we're using the one from the 2021 regional plan. And just as a refresher, about half of our regional emissions come from the transportation sector. And then we've got about a quarter coming from electricity um, and then some more from natural gas and then less and less from other sectors. Um, so those are areas we wanna focus in. Uh, included with this is identifying the biggest bang for your buck near-term actions to reduce greenhouse gases, but there's also uh, an analysis for low-income and disadvantaged communities. How do these priority measures, do they also prioritize underserved or marginalized communities? Uh, there'll also be an analysis uh, of air pollution issues, health issues like that. Uh, so it's gonna be broader than your typical cap. Um, and I think I could kind of pass this. We're trying to do a, a timeline of working through uh, the steps that are required in the cap. I'll say we're looking at getting these measures figured out likely in the November timeframe where we can bring it back to, for you to throw darts at. Uh, and then having a draft plan more toward January. But to, to make it more real, some of the things what we've been hearing from stakeholders so far about and they consider near-term actions are reducing air pollution through, whether it's efficiency, renewables, other decarbonization efforts, reducing VMT or vehicle miles traveled. That can be through you know, increasing bike lanes or bike plans, transit options. Uh, also on the EV infrastructure, as well as vehicles, seeing that for addressing passenger vehicles, buses, trucks. Uh, how do we make those vehicles that are on the road for um, folks that are still driving or goods movement, make them cleaner? Uh, other things are tackling your existing buildings. This could be homes and commercial buildings. How do we make them more efficient? How do uh, we get rid of some natural gas that can be having some issues for folks with health issues inside a home or a commercial building? Uh, and then several other measures around water, urban forests, and things like that. So right now we're pretty wide open. Like we want to hear what's important to people before we start crafting and you know pre-deciding things. Uh, another element of the grant that I was mentioning. So this uh, PCAP CCAP is part of EPA's Phase One, and so this Phase One grant will be developing a community engagement plan and actually a wider engagement plan for how we work with uh, governments and such as well. We have funding for the community-based organizations, and really we're looking at the contracts that you all already have in effect, as this is our first tier, first try approach for how can we also you know, have some really dedicated engagement in communities and pay you for your time. Uh, so bear with us as we're gonna learn with you <laughs> on how we make this work. Uh, and we're gonna have that uh, additional community analysis element, not just greenhouse gas emission reductions part. 
And this all feeds into something that's happening kind of at the same time. EPA has what they're calling their phase two implementation grants. It's almost $5 billion nationwide, B is in very billion dollars of competitive grant funds to implement these near-term projects. And EPA has stated that 40% of these funds are to benefit projects in disadvantaged and low-income communities. What that means exactly, we're still figuring out, but that's something where we wanna be coming back to several times over this process to gain input and direction. So in terms of the outreach and engagement plan and approach, uh, what we've done is uh, over the course, we have about $150,000 set aside for CBO engagement activities. Uh, again, the project runs for four years, but really the heavy lifting's in the first two years. So I, I would assume more so for that, that funding to be in, mainly in the first two years. Uh, we wanna build on outreach and engagement efforts that have already happened and maybe you've already participated in with local governments when they were doing their climate action plans or the county similarly with uh, in the past couple of years have been working on a regional decarbonization framework. Uh, so we wanna build off of what's happened. We also wanna build off any community events or activities you're already doing that are in this environmental space, health space, um, so that we're not creating extra meetings for folks to go to and you know, time is precious. So wanna hear about that as well. Uh, in addition to these things, we're going to a lot of working groups at SANDAG. We'll be going to a lot of uh, our committees and such, including a tribal working group, uh, military working group, sustainable communities and mobility are big ones. Uh, we're also meeting with local government staff that work on climate plans and sustainability uh, pretty much monthly through this process to make sure we're learning what they worked on and adopted in their local jurisdictions. And we're really seeking today and going forward input from you, your thoughts on, you know, best approaches that for working within your communities, working with you, um, or also, you know, what do you really not like doing? And let's try to avoid that too. Uh, so this is the piece that this is all a reason we want to get this priority cap or PCAP done by March 1st. EPA released a grant opportunity just last week. Uh, they call it a NOFO, a notice of funding opportunity for the follow-on competitive grants. So they have $4.6 billion available uh, nationwide. The, the grants, the lead organization has to be, whether it's a state, uh, regional government like SANDAG or an air district or a local government can also be a tribal government. Um, $300 million of this pot is set aside for tribes and territories, but tribes and territories can apply to the larger pot as well. Uh, we're looking at having coordination uh, in both areas. I had mentioned that 40% of funds are supposed to benefit projects, kind of to get to what Barry was saying in the last one it, around EV chargers, you know, it's missing in certain communities that need it. So maybe that's one type of project. Uh, and the grant applications for this competitive piece are due one month after the planning grant piece is due to EPA. So these will be due April 1st, 2024. Um, they gave us a lot of notice, but it's really so that all the states, these grants were open to uh, about the 70 most populous metro areas in the country, as well as all of the states to do these priority climate action plans and comprehensive ones. So that's who's gonna be jockeying for, for the funding to support their states or local communities. Uh, again, the focus will be near-term actions. So not your long-term projects that are 10 years, 15, 20 years out. What can we get done in the next five years? Uh, and I included a link to where they put that on the website if anybody wants to check it out, but you're welcome to just talk to me or Samaya or others on my team as well. So our next steps here are really for us to develop an engagement plan for this priority cap. Um, part of doing that is by having conversations with you all, likely going into the CBO network meeting as well. Uh, we wanna collaborate with you on outreach options, have you help us define what 
what that could be. Uh, we'll be developing the draft of this plan by our goal is for early January so that folks can be seeing it. But we plan to be meeting at least with pieces of this is measures we think that are gonna happen or types of programs so people can throw darts at that. Uh, and we wanna get community input throughout and that could even be with some surveys like paper copy or online on uh, Instagram, things like that as well. Uh, same kind of, a, some of the approaches that were mentioned in the other two items today. So from that, that's really the end of my initial take. I mean, the board just approved the project a few weeks ago. So we're getting started and working hard and I'll, I'll stop there and would love to get any initial feedback from folks. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Any questions or comments from the working group members? Faye and then Jesse? And then Rose. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, actually, there's been a lot of studies made about environmental health and personal health, especially in air pollution. Um, I know that the American Lung Association has a lot of information about air pollution and lungs. So probably in the perspective of health and wellness, we can probably um, explore the different resources that are available among these health associations and build our movement from there. I appreciate that. Thank you. We'll look into that for sure. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Susan. I think this is a wonderful opportunity, right, to bring funds to a region and kind of uh, try to address some of the challenges, right, that we are facing. Um, I have a question. Uh, uh, I guess it's outside of like kind of like the outreach. Um, you mentioned that this grant is um, like a planning grant. So uh, I'm just wondering, um, you might not have an answer. Um, is there potentially, um, you know, maybe Sandak has outside funds that could be used to implement some of the things that are identified in, in the PCAP, right, the first kind of phase? Because um, I'm, I'm thinking, right, if it's a planning grant, uh, some, we might want to implement some of these things, right? And if not, um, is the federal government, like, forecasted to have opportunities to fund some of the, the projects that are identified through these initiatives? So that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, so it's um, it's these what EPA is calling phase one and phase two. So this first part, the planning grant and the PCAP, yeah, we plan to be identifying, it could be a measure to, uh, and I'm just saying this, we don't know yet, reduce VMT by, you know, promoting more um, e-bikes or regular bikes and having some sort of incentive or rebate. And so, you know, that could be one way to do it, or it could be by improving service for transit or more access to transit, or even the buses being zero emission or something like that. Uh, so then that phase two grant that's due April 1st, to EPA is to fund these types of measures. So, but we have to have it written in the priority cap to be eligible for the competitive funds. So that's why I was happy to see that EPA put the announcement out last week so that now we can really make sure the plan meets the needs that we hear from folks in the region. But we're, we're learning, it's all brand new right now. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just have a question. Um, I think it was on slide number six where you had the map and it had the names of the uh, organizations. Um, I don't see Bayside's name there. Oh, I'm sorry. We have the Linda Vista Collaborative. My mistake. Oh, thank okay. I, I'm like, I grabbed it off our website, but I didn't yeah, double okay. check that I had right. the most I didn't recent see Bayside, one. But now I see the Linda Vista okay. Collaborative. So perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Eva. Yes, of course. I have a question regarding CBO engagement. So the 150K, is that money that our, the member organizations of this group are going to use to do outreach or it's a separate RFP process? Um, we're going to be working with Paula and Kat uh, about the, I know that there was contracts made where we can issue a task order type thing. So mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we want to at least offer to everyone. It could be that, you know, maybe your organization doesn't have capacity at this moment, but you want to participate, you know, at next year on it. We're we were flexible on that, but it's for use. I, I wouldn't foresee it as an RFP, but more of issuing the task order, but I've got to get the details on the on the contracts first. Yeah. Um, but that's our intent is to offer 
to use that this for everybody to yeah. use for this absolutely and so i know it's still in the works but is there an expected start date just so we get a sense within organizations if we want to participate what that workload looks like i would think um either toward the end of this year which is of course by the holidays so maybe that doesn't work but for sure january february march i think is important i we're seeing if we can get enough done to make it worthwhile for you know to you to have different events and have people have something to look at and talk about um this fall so potentially end of this year but definitely we're thinking um and by january excellent thank you Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll transition to public comments. Clerk, do we have any? Thank you, we have one public commenter, virtual, the original draw, please go ahead. Yeah, it's sad, because if you guys don't, you know, play the game of the federal and state government, they're not gonna give you guys money, not gonna give you the people's money to, you know, throw away because everything is fraud, waste, and abuse that's going on. You're blatantly lying to the people to get them into a new way of living. And if you don't do it, right, then you're not going to get money to pretend to do it and put people in this new way of living. But do you even understand where this whole agenda comes from? Do you guys know about the United Nations at all? Um, probably because, you know, Sandag engages there. But do you understand that they are globalist elites who aren't elected? who are deciding these things for us along with like, Hey, what the world economic forum, you know, Klaus Schwab, you know, he wants us to own nothing and be happy. Um, it's not about saving the planet it has nothing to do with that. It's about total control over the people and putting them into, you know, either 15 minute cities or whatever enslavement camps where there's all this smart technology and we're de-incentivizing people to dry because we have to save the planet. We have to save the planet, even if it kills people, right? You know, so we, you know, do all of these things to incentivize and and de-incentivize uh, this new way of living, right? All while people suffer. It's like we got people that are homeless on the streets and we're just like, listen, we only have so much money for you. But do you know what? If you play the game with us to save the planet, we'll give you all the money in the world and we'll, you know, do all these things like, you know, preserve land and a bunch of BS that isn't really going to move the needle forward. Because if everybody in the world doesn't do it, it won't matter unless you put us in a freaking bubble. All right. Because you can't have people like even crossing state lines and being like, you have to use this kind of vehicle. Oh my gosh, but then if they have a gas vehicle, are they going to be able to cross state lines? And are they going to be able to, are you going to get rid of gas stations, right? But what happens if somebody goes to another state and they're trying to use their electric vehicle? And they're like, well, we don't have any infrastructure here. Well, that keeps you in your zone, right? And as long as we can't go that far, right? Then we're, you know, able to be kept in this like little area, right? I mean, they want us to basically work where we live. So, I mean, are you guys going to start living in there? You know, are you guys going to be biking? Are you guys going to be doing all the things that you socially equitably want for everybody? It's like there will never be equity because you're always trying to up one over another. That is an equal. If you do them all at the same time equally, that is equity. But you can't be like, we're going to help these people because they've been left behind. And so we're going to leave these people behind. It's a bunch of BS. And you guys sit here and like, oh, man, we're paying you to do it, which is so sad. Because you're literally lying to the people about all these things and you probably don't even know yourself. That's why you need to educate yourself before you sit here and talk about a bunch of BS about climate change and wasting the. Your time expired. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. All right. Moving on to item seven. Any possible topics that you all have with regards to future meetings? Faye? Okay. I do remember in the past that we have decided something like to define social equity because it's too vague for many people, yeah. even for the board members. I think we should start defining it. Yeah. At least have some concepts, standards, and guidelines. Yeah, I no, I think that would be way. great. Yeah. I know we had talked about that. I think it was a few meetings ago. Um, just, I, I, and I think there was a video that I had mentioned that we, I, and I'm happy to have our city manager send that over, but I think just having a baseline understanding of what 
equity, first what equity means, then what social equity means, I think would be really helpful because I think um, it can be defined so many different ways. And I think just like you said, having that baseline understanding, um, I think out in the public, it tends to be misconstrued into a lot of different things. So just having the ability to make sure that everyone's starting off with the same definition is important. So yes, thank you for bringing that back up. I think that's really necessary for us. If I could just uh, make a comment, the first item we have up there is our equity action plan. And I know that's something that's currently in the works. And um, when that is ready to come here, I think that might be the, a good opportunity to have that conversation. The equity action plan is a region, a region an agency-wide effort that sort of will have all the different ways and the different things that we are doing around social equity. May I ask really quick when we anticipate that? I knew that was going to be the next question. Um, both Kat and I talk closely with the project manager on that, Catherine Thibault. I'll double check with her. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if there's any way we could at least have the discussion around the definition prior to that, I think it would be helpful. I, I know that all of us, uh, and you all more so than me, because I've just recently joined you all, you know, these discussions are happening here and then going out into the communities. And I feel like it's so important for folks given just all of the discussions happening in all of our local jurisdictions as well, what equity truly means, because I think it gets misconstrued so much that we just need to have that discussion sooner rather than later so that if people are tuning in or even not, if we're all able to then disseminate that information out into the communities based on the conversation here and do so in a way that's transparent, I think that would be really helpful, so. Okay, great. Anybody else have any other topics? Barry? So used to, never mind. Um, us making a presentation to the board. We've outreached a lot into our communities and it would really, I think, and if we see a value in it is the community doesn't necessarily vote on the regional plan, the board does. So it seems like it would be good if we could, I don't know what that looks like, just make short presentations to them, letting them know the importance of the regional plan and how it affects our community. Because there might be the little disconnect of saying that these you know, people are, you know what I'm saying, just make it a little more personal. And, and have some interaction with him if everybody sees any value in that. Yeah, Lisa. I agree with you, Barry, on that because this way we can, they know we're here as a group, but what are we really, who do we represent and what have we accomplished maybe in the last year? So this way they know that, okay, you know, we're the social equ equity group is, you know, they're here and this is what they're proactive in the community. So I think it's a good time for, you know, possibly to, given our, you know, our input, or at least, you know, a, a list of what we've accomplished and see who wants to be the speaker, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> Not just teasing, but that's a good idea. And a couple months ago, right? One thing I noticed is they all stopped talking among themselves. Once they heard it was a social equity working group, I'm looking at everybody on the board and they put stuff down, they put their phones down. And so that told me that 30 seconds, they want to hear from us. Thank you for the suggestion. We're definitely talking with our team about how we can incorporate, if not members of this group, absolutely some of the um, thoughts that you've shared just through these meetings and also in the final reports that you recently um, turned into us. So there are at least there is at least one meeting coming up where we're going to be sharing information on here's all the community efforts that took place the last several months. Here's what we're hearing from the community. So that one seems like it would make the most sense. Again, still figuring out if we can involve members of this group or at a minimum, in, you know, include your um, thoughts and sort of your findings and your experiences, given your close work um, the last couple of months, especially. And we also want to make sure that we provide you the meeting dates, like, hey, it would be this, this is happening at this meeting date, so that um, if you want to come as a public present, you know, as a public commenter, you can, and sort of just have your 
your thoughts and your comments prepared and know when those items will be coming to the board. So it would be extra relevant. Just a quick question, Paula. Uh, is it possible for one of the working group members to be there in conjunction with staff as well? I know in the city, we're able to have like, if we have commissions, have a commission member present on behalf of the commission. So just just comments, it would obviously be like a certain time frame. So just curious if that's being talked about as well. Yep, we actually okay. just had a meeting with members from our public affairs team because they're starting to think through the meeting. I believe it's gonna be in November. So we have a little bit of time. They're starting to think through, you know, how that information will be shared, what the presentation okay. will look like. and. Um, we are having the conversation. Great, awesome. Thank you. Anybody else have any suggestions? Okay, seeing none, I know I need to ask for public comment. Do we have any at this time? We have one public comment on this item, the original draw, please go ahead. Thank you, I didn't think you were actually gonna let me speak on this and I don't need three minutes, but I think that, um, that you should bring up these lithium batteries and do a study on them and the safety of them so that you can present that and not have it be just by biased people, um, you know, really do your due diligence and look into it and see the dangers of them as far as them just combusting um, when they're just sitting there. Also, um, they were having trouble in Hawaii because a bunch of them were combusting and that had to do with the salt water uh, and we're right on the coast. So I think you guys need to look into that and also the radiation that comes out of the charging stations <clears throat> when they're being charged. Um, maybe even a study of what's coming off the vehicle as far as radiation is concerned because we know our telephones and any kind of technology, even smart meters, all like light bulbs, they put off radiation. Um, and so when we have like a big bus or, you know, when we're trying to create infrastructure for charging, you know, huge trucks and buses, that's going to create more radiation. So I would urge you guys to, you know, for the safety of the people um, to look into that and make sure that you're providing them with the right information because it is a danger to um, not only their health and safety, but the, but the environment as well. So if you're going to push these things, I would encourage you to look into that so that you can, you know, with full on knowledge and confidence speak the truth and not just, you know, speak out of both sides of your mouths because you don't know the answers and you need to push this agenda because it's coming from above you. Um, it's literally a, a, a very big concern and it should be a concern of yours when you're incentivizing people to, you know, go into this new way of life. So, um, you know, the lithium batteries, as well as the charging um, stations um, for all means of transportation, say, you know, going from this smaller micro mobility up into a big bus and or trucks to make sure that what you're pushing is legit and that you are on the right side of what you speak of, because I guarantee you, you're not and you just don't know it. And that's negligent to be incentivizing people and pushing this Um when you're claiming that, you know, certain things are safe uh, and, and you're, you know, doing safety updates. Um, so please do that um, for the people, you know, if you pretend it's not me saying it so that you'll look into it um, because it is important. So that's it. That concludes the public comments. Okay, thank you. Before moving on to the next item, I just wanted to thank Angela from the Chula Vista Community Collaborative and Jennifer from Vista Community Clinic for joining us today. Really appreciate you all being here and joining us for these discussions. And uh, our next item is just moving moving on to the upcoming meetings, which is our scheduled meeting on October 26th, and that'll be at 9.30 here at the Sandag 401B Street location. Any questions or comments before we adjourn the meeting from our working group members? Okay, seeing none, thank you all for coming today, and we are adjourned at 11.20 a.m.